If you're looking at a distant star and there's dust between you and that star, the star will appear redder than expected. This phenomenon is called interstellar reddening, and it happens because of the interactions between the starlight and the dust between you and the star. As the light from a distant object travels through interstellar space, any dust grains that it may encounter will scatter out the bluer, shorter wavelengths of light, allowing only the redder, longer wavelength light to pass through to the observer. What the observer sees is an image of the star that looks redder than it actually is. This doesn't mean the star has to actually be red, just redder than it would appear without the dust obscuring it. Here we see two intensity versus frequency spectra. The one on the top represents the light radiating outward from the star, unobstructed by the dust. We can see the spectrum is in full effect, with intensities exactly where they should be across the various frequencies of light. When the light passes through the dust and comes out on the other side, its bluer intensities have been diminished because they've been scattered out. So now it has more intense red light, causing the star to look redder. The further away an object is, the more layers of interstellar dust its light has to travel through to reach you. Take, for example, these two emission nebulae. NGC 3603 on the left is located much further away from the Earth than NGC 3576, which has fondly been nicknamed the Statue of Liberty Nebula because of this distinctive feature in its center. At a distance of 20,000 light years from the Earth, light from NGC 3603 must travel through over 10,000 trillion miles of interstellar space, encountering many different interstellar dust clouds along the way. This explains why it looks slightly redder than the more pinkish Statue of Liberty Nebula, which is only 9,000 light years away. The stars on the left side of this image of Lynn's Dark Nebula, LDN 483, show extreme amounts of interstellar reddening. We can even see examples of the same concept that results in interstellar reddening right here on Earth. In these images of the 4th of July fireworks at the Rose Bowl taken from up near Mount Wilson Observatory, we can see that the light of the fireworks themselves is getting obscured by the smoke in front of it. Now, of course, this phenomenon wouldn't be called interstellar reddening since it's happening right here on Earth and not between the stars, but the concept behind interstellar reddening still holds true here, too. We can even see an example of the interstellar reddening concept in images from the smoke-filled Yosemite Valley, during the California wildfires of 2018, the view that was supposed to look like this looked like this. Even our one and only sun looked redder than usual on those few days for the same reason that the stars behind clouds of interstellar dust would look red. Interstellar reddening is just half the story, though. We know that the dust can scatter light, but if there's a whole lot of dust, all of that scattered light gets scattered and scattered and scattered again and scattered again until there's really nowhere for that scattered light to go, so it just gets absorbed. In these cases, the total luminosity of the visible starlight is not only diminished, but it could be diminished so much with increasing amounts of dust that the star can completely disappear from view. Now we can point out the dark obscure region in LDN 483, which we used as a prominent example of interstellar reddening earlier. But now we know that this particular feature is interstellar extinction, an area of interstellar dust that's just so thick that none of the light from behind can actually penetrate through. Barnard 68 is one of the best examples of one such area where not only interstellar reddening can be seen around the edges of the black void in the center, but the black void itself is actually not a void at all, but rather it's interstellar extinction. But Bernard 68 isn't even the most impressive dark nebula out there. I mean, sure, it's incredible to think that we're looking at a cloud of interstellar dust that's almost a half a light year across, nearly 3 trillion miles from one side to the other, but if we look at the larger system of dark nebulae to which it belongs, it's mind-boggling to think how many larger dark nebulae exist out there. Like the Snake Nebula here on the right, for example. Another great example is the Horsehead Nebula, a dark nebula that we briefly looked at when looking at emission nebulae in the previous video. The bright pinkish-red background is the emission nebula in front of which the Horsehead Nebula is silhouetted. Light from the stars behind the Horsehead Nebula does not penetrate all the way through to us, though through some of the less dense regions of this dust cloud, we do actually see some of the reddened stars. 
One of the best places, though, to look for interstellar reddening and specifically interstellar extinction is in the heart of the Milky Way galaxy itself. If we aim our view to the constellation Ophiuchus, near Sagittarius, we can see the Pipe Nebula, an area of interstellar extinction shaped much like a tobacco pipe. The Pipe Nebula is actually just one part of the larger Dark Horse Nebula, an even larger area of interstellar extinction. If we zoom in on the belly of the Dark Horse, we'll see a familiar sight. Barnard 68. Remember this thing? Turns out we've actually figured out a way to look through it. Remember, this concept is called interstellar reddening because only the longer, redder wavelengths can pass through if there's not too much dust. In the cases of interstellar extinction, there is too much dust, so we don't really see anything at all through that particular part of the cloud. But if we look for longer and longer and longer wavelengths of light, we'll start seeing the stars that are actually behind this dark nebula. This false color composite combines three separate wavelengths, one optical and two infrared, to give us this view through the dark nebula Barnard 68. This is a useful trick we'll have to keep in mind when we begin to think about the star formation process, coming up in the next video.